Hey guys, I'm Myers, and the organism that I chose is the sockeye salmon. They live in Alaska, Canada, and Kamchatka, as you can see right here on the map. And while juveniles, sockeye live in freshwater. As they mature, they migrate to the ocean. Later in life, they return to freshwater lakes and streams to spawn, as they only spawn in freshwater. The salmon die within two weeks after spawning. The salmon are anadromous, meaning they live in both freshwater and saltwater. Because of this, they are able to bring nutrients from the ocean back into lakes and rivers. Although most live in freshwater and saltwater, Kokanee salmon are a variety of sockeye that are landlocked and live in lakes their entire lives. Eggs are laid in streams or lakes near the shore. The salmon will dig a small nest, called a red, in the sand to lay their eggs in. Upon hatching, the fish are called alevin. They have small yolk sacs still attached to their ventral sides and do not leave the boundary of the red. When the yolk is consumed, the fish are called fry. At this stage, they get their nutrients from aquatic plants and plankton. At this point, the fry start migrating downstream towards estuaries. Once there, they reach the smolt stage, where they turn a silver color, begin to adjust to higher salinity, and feed in the ocean. After they have been adjusted, sockeye live in the ocean for an average of three to four years. This is their oceanic adult stage. After this period of time, salmon begin to return to fresh water. Their jaw begins to curve and their coloration becomes darker. You can see that here in this picture down here, we have a darker salmon that is living in the fresh water, as opposed to the more silvery colored saltwater salmon. Because they're traveling back upstream, they have to travel as much as 50 kilometers a day and leap over fallen trees and salmon ladders. Once they reach their nesting site, salmon will die and their bodies will become nutrients for decomposers. This is the food web for the sockeye salmon. When I was picking a topic, I picked a freshwater organism, so I specifically made the food web such that all organisms here could be found in a freshwater environment. When the salmon migrate to the ocean, the food web changes as the ecosystem changes. For example, it starts to eat shrimp, but it also may be eaten by sharks and lampreys. Interestingly, as far as my research could tell, there are no bears in the Pacific Ocean. At the bottom of the food web is the phytoplankton, which are consumed by zooplankton. These, in turn, are eaten by insects, which give nutrients to the sockeye. Salmon can be eaten by osprey, bald eagles, and bears. As you can see here, my avatar is covering it up. Because the life cycle of the sockeye involves large varieties of predators and huge migration, there are many stressors that affect the fish. For example, dams, culverts, and fishing, as well as pollution of freshwater and saltwater, can harm the salmon population. Another interesting facet of the sockeye is that because each fish only spawns in the location it was hatched, if all salmon from one particular river or lake are exterminated, then that river or lake's population will not recover. This can lead to localized endangerment of sockeye, such as in the Snake River here. One adaptation that sockeye have made is the escape response. The escape response is not particular to only sockeye. In fact, it actually exists in all teleosts, which is a class of fish. There has been a lot of research on the characterization of fish behavior. It has been found that the escape response results from an initial S-turn and C-turn. Though escaping from predators is one function, bends can also be used in other situations, such as predator attacks and social interactions. Now that's all well and good, but what is the underlying circuit behind this behavior? It turns out that there are several circuits that can cause both the C and S shape. This table gives us a really nice classification of which circuit is being activated depending upon the latency and the behavior. Down here, we can see that the M cell is necessary for the fast escape response. M cells stand for Mauthner cell, which is a large neuron in the ventral nerve cord. Okay, so imagine you are a salmon swimming in a river. Suddenly, a bear swipes and grazes you. 
you might display an escape response. Many sensory cells project onto the mouth or cell, including mechanosensory, auditory, and visual. If the bear isn't very close, only one of the mouth or cells might fire. Looking at the graph, we can see that when only the right cell fires, we get a C response. Let's take a quick look at the circuitry. Do you see this fish up here? The activation of the right mouth or cell causes contraction in the muscle fibers located in the left side of the body. Not only this, but the right mouth or cell is activating this cell down here called colo. This is an inhibitory interneuron that prevents the left mouth or cell from firing and contracting both sides of the body at the same time. In class, we learned about how neurons use chemicals to transmit information. However, this is not always the case. It turns out that there are multiple ways for neurons to share information. This is a gap junction. There are channels here called connexins, which act as bridges to let ions flow from one neuron directly to another. This is a type of synapse called an electrical synapse. There is another type of transmission that is under the umbrella of electrical synapses. This is called the faptic transmission. This type of synapse utilizes electric fields to communicate with other neurons. For example, a faptic transmission is found in the retina where it causes horizontal cells to repolarize cones. It turns out that the mouth or cell also takes advantage of this coupling, and it all revolves around potassium and the unique architecture of the cell. Here is a video I animated. I hope you enjoy. Apologies about the watermark in the corner. So here we have a mouth or cells, and there's two of them. There's one on the left side, and there's one on the right side. And remember that this is a motor neuron, which means that it's going to be innervating muscle fibers. So to make the muscle fibers move back and forth, what's going to happen is that the left mouth nerve cell is going to turn on and move the right side of the muscles. And then the right mouth nerve cell is going to turn on and move the left side of the muscles. And this oscillatory motion is going to drive the fish forwards. Remember that the mouth nerve cell is associated with the escape response. So this is a very powerful movement that the fish is generating, and it can't keep it up indefinitely. Eventually, it's going to get tired. So there's got to be a process that stops the mouth or cell from working after a period of time. All right, so let's set the stage. These purple dots that you see here are called glial cells, and they're essentially a structural support for the neuron. In this region, they're tightly packed together, so ions have a difficult time getting through. This region is also called the axon cap by biologists. When the mouth or cell activates, it sends an action potential down through the axon, which is indicated by the sodium ion moving down through the axon. Eventually, it reaches the synapse where the cell communicates with muscle fibers, telling the fish to move. The green cells you see here are inhibitory cells, and they're actually going to prevent the mouth or cell from firing in the future. In order for the mouth or cell to communicate with the inhibitory neurons, it's got to excite them. So there's another synapse in which the inhibitory cells are excited. Inhibitory cells have their own action potential. As voltage-gated sodium channels close, voltage-gated potassium channels will open, causing potassium ions to flow into the extracellular fluid. As the spike reaches the synapse, potassium will flow out of the cell into the axon cap. If there are enough synapses, eventually there will be a buildup of positive charge. Here's the coolest part. Remember the glial cells? They're actually packed so tightly together that potassium ions can't escape. In fact, after repeated firings of the inhibitory neurons, eventually there will be a huge buildup of positive charge. This buildup is so great that it actually produces its own electric field. Positive charges like sodium and potassium are pushed away from the axon hillock, preventing future action potentials from taking place. These cations aren't actually leaving the cell, there's still a cell membrane, but they're pushed away from the region where there's the highest electrical gradient. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. If you have any questions, you can always ask me in person or shoot me an email. Thanks again.